Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Michaela, and in today's video, I have my March wrap up for you. So I actually had a really good reading month in March. I started this month in a bit of a reading slump, but I read a lot of really good books this month and some new favorites, and so I'm really excited to talk about all of them with you today. Um, so for this wrap up, I am changing the style of it a little bit and I'm grouping my ratings together, starting from the lowest all the way up to the top. So a little breakdown of my stats for the month. I have six five stars, five four stars, five three stars, and one two star. Nothing lower than a two. So six five stars, four four stars, that is really good. And like I said, I have some new favorites this month, like favorites of the year. So I'm really excited to talk about them. So let's go ahead and get right into it. Starting with my lowest rated book of the month, my two star rating, that book is The Golden Spoon by Jessa Maxwell. And like I said, I only gave this book two stars. This is one of the more recent books that I read. Um, and I have a lot of thoughts on it. So The Golden Spoon is a little bit like the Great British Bake Off um, mixed with like a murder mystery. So we follow six contestants and two hosts and the book picks right up with like a dead body being found in the baking tent and there's sabotage that goes on and we're basically working our way from the past into the future until we see like who is that and what happened. So I had a couple issues with this book. I honestly found it really, really boring, like up until the part where the contestants start baking, which is about like 15% into the book. I was really bored with the backstories and the exposition. There is a lot of POVs in this book. Like I said, we have six contestants and two hosts. Um, so I think, I don't, I think one of the hosts doesn't ever get their own perspective, but there's a total of like seven different character point of views that we follow so it's a lot to it's a lot to follow and it's kind of boring just like learning everybody's backstory I don't think we needed all of that um, but yeah once they start baking it does get a little bit more interesting and I do love baking shows and I love the Great British Bake Off so I was extremely excited for that aspect of this book um, there are some sabotage moments that happen in the tent and those were my favorite parts of the book but the thing is there's really only two moments of, there's only two moments of like sabotage and baking within the tent. And that is my biggest issue with this book is I, I'm confused what it's being marketed as because I went into this expecting like, you know, a cozy mystery. So I was extremely excited for the baking aspect and to have something similar to the Great British Bake Off, like only like a murder mystery version, you know? So there is not enough baking and you know, sabotage moments and the contestants in there and the hosts like interacting with them in the tent. There is not enough of that. It's such a small portion of this book. Like I said, there's only like two real bakes that happen, I think, and only two moments of sabotage and it's so quick and then it's over. So there's not enough baking to, for me to call this like a cozy mystery, you know, but there's the majority of this book takes place where the contestants are living in this manor like right outside the tent for the duration of the filming period and the majority of the book takes place with them like at this manor and interacting with one another and this place is kind of creepy and there's like some mystery there and then like the contestants interacting with each other and interacting with the host outside of the competition and outside of the filming that's the majority of the book so that to me is more of the murder mystery like you know mystery aspect and to me this book was not complex enough did not have enough mystery for it to really be like a mystery like a strong mystery and it didn't have enough of that like cozy cute baking aspect for it to be a cozy mystery so I really don't know like what this book was it wasn't enough of either in my opinion so like one of my notes I wrote down was I said and this is kind of rude, but I said it's none too complex. It doesn't take many brain cells to follow this. Like, I feel like it's so predictable from the start of this book, like what's going on, what's going to happen. It's just really predictable. And it's not, like I said, it's, it's not complex enough to be like a good mystery. And what I was most excited about, like the baking aspect, it has so little of that. So I don't know, it just, 
overall it really underwhelmed me and I think at first I had it at a three star but like after reconsidering it and just reconsidering how predictable and I just didn't feel like this had anything new and it was really boring to me that's why it's a it's only a two star like I can see some people liking it but for me it just did not do it so I only had one two star of the month moving on to my three stars the first one I'm going to talk about is Little Eve by Catriona Ward I read a lot of Catriona Ward's books this year. I actually have another one to talk about in this video that I read in March. Um, and I really enjoyed her writing and her book so far this year. This is the lowest rated one I have given her so far, Little Eve. And that is honestly down to my own personal preferences. So Little Eve is pretty much a cult story. It follows a group of individuals who live on this Scottish Isle and they are, you know, cloistered away from the rest of the town they're like on this island and basically they disappeared onto this island one day like the kids used to go to school in town and they used to go to town and visit but one day they all like went away to their island and they never came out so people there's like rumors about what goes on there and in the very beginning we go to the island because somebody's bringing them food and um he discovers them all dead and it looks like they were performing some sort of ritual because everybody's laid out in like this circle and their eyes are missing and it's like very ritualistic how he finds them and one of them is actually still alive so she comes back and then we start flipping back perspectives um trying to you know loop back to what happened and what led up to them all dying so you know, this book was good. Like there was nothing really wrong with it in my opinion. I just, I do not like cult stories. So this for me was, it just didn't work for me. Like to me, cults, they're always about the same thing. And that's one man parading himself over a bunch of women. And it's so boring and it just makes me really angry. And I always feel like cult stories are rooted in a special kind of misogyny that I just honestly have no interest in reading about like I know a lot of people are really into cults and I just can't stand it like seeing this one guy who's like you know telling all these women what to do and you know basically taking advantage of them and I just don't like it I did find the characters in this book really interesting and I loved the setting like the Scottish setting it was just the conflict for me was it was annoying like I also don't like religious horror and this has some of that you know because we have our people that are being convinced by this cult leader that everyone in the village is impure and if they do something wrong then like if the people who in within the cult do something wrong they're shunned or they are have tar put on their lips and they're put down in the cellar so they can't speak to anyone and they can't eat or drink for days at a time and it's just oh it's frustrating i don't like it like it doesn't scare me it just makes me angry and i don't need to be angry there's enough in this world to make me angry so i am a huge fan of catriona war's writing and her prose in this book was no less than what i would expect from her so the writing was very good it's very atmospheric and has re really good gothic vibes so if you're if writing an atmosphere is important to you i think you would really enjoy little eve I just overall didn't enjoy my reading experience. Like I said, the cult trope just is not for me. Um, I did also find the last chapter to be a little bit confusing. I, I don't want to go into it and give spoilers, but it was just kind of strange. And I think that was because I started really like fast forwarding through this book and like skimming to get to the end because I just was so not into it. Like just the storyline, I was not into it. So maybe I missed some details or something, but I thought the last chapter was very strange and confusing. Like not the twist, like I understand that, but mm, if you read this book, you might know there's this moment where a character is like, just randomly comes out of the waves. Like they're like swimming and scare these children. And I'm like, why was this character randomly in the water swimming? and they just come up out of the water. Like that was so bizarre. So yeah, three stars. I, I, I said that I probably wouldn't reread that, but you know, the track record that I've been having with Catriona Ward, like I am just loving her book so much that I honestly kind of want to reread that book and reread it physically without an audiobook and just read it and keeping in mind, like I'm reading this for the prose and the writing. Like don't take in mind the story so much. Like, I don't know, That's kind, that sounds kind of dumb, but I could see myself possibly rereading that in the future and giving it a higher rating and, you know, dissecting it for 
the writing itself and appreciating the writing and not so much the story but yes let's move on so the next book i have to talk about that i read in march is the devil makes three by tori bovolino so this book i wanted to read because i was giving authors that i had gave five stars in the past like another go to see if i could get another five star book out of them and the five star book that i had read from tori bovolino before was not good for maidens which was one of my favorite books of 2022 um but this book just it really didn't do it for me like if you don't read a lot of ya and you find ya a little bit annoying um at this point in your life like for me at this point in my life like ya is a little bit hard for me to stomach this book will not work for you um there was some good writing and good descriptions in here that I really enjoyed. Um, also, okay, so I didn't say what this book is about. Basically, it's like a dark academia. Um, our two main characters, one works in the library and one often goes to the library because he loves studying and he's always in the library and he's actually a witch. So he's always in the library and I think he's trying to find a cure for his mother's illness because she's very sick and she's probably going to die from her illness soon. So he's trying to like figure out some way magical to save her and one day these two find like this basement in the library that leads to these leads to this room with this magical book and they take this book out of the library and they basically unleash like a demon out of the book and then the demon starts you know kind of antagonizing the both of them and they have to figure out you know how to put him back in the book so it was cool, I thought, to see a male character with witchy abilities and the girl being the human with no powers because I feel like, especially often in YA, like the trope is usually flipped. Um, especially like witch, like witches, that trope is very gendered where it's always, we see witch, women as witches. So I thought it was cool that the male character was the witch. Um, my biggest issue in this book though was the romance between the two main characters. I absolutely cannot read YA romances anymore. Like, I cannot do it. There is something so cringy to me about two teenagers describing, like, the curve of each other's lips and how much their hearts race when they touch each other's hands. Like, I just can't do it. Like, I just find it so cringy, so cheesy. Um, every time there was a romantic moment between these two characters, I, I had to start skimming because it was just making my eyes roll so much. Like... It, it's a me issue really it's a me issue like I think people might like this book if you still like YA and there's nothing wrong with YA like I don't mean this to come off any sort of way you know if you love YA that's great there's nothing wrong with it but I just think for me sometimes it reads a little bit cheesy and that's what I was getting from this like the romance between these two it just it felt a little bit forced at times and I didn't like it. I, I wanted more from this overall so that was a three star the next book I have to talk about is The Cloisters by Katie Hayes. Um, so The Cloisters is also a little bit of a dark academia. It's pitched that way sometimes. It follows our main character who has just um, completed her graduate. She's, gotten, she's gone through graduate school. She's graduating from that. And she is accepting this like internship position for this art museum in New York City. Something like that. And so she moves from her hometown to New York and starts working in this like very secretive faction of this museum where they study tarot cards um, and they are called the Cloisters. And this book, so I actually just started reading um, The Secret History by Donna Tartt. I'm not, I'm like a hundred pages into it, but I am seeing so many parallels between the secret history in the cloisters so i can see that katie hayes got a lot of inspiration from the secret history um when she was writing her own book so if you love the secret history i think you would like the cloisters just because it has really similar vibes um there was really good writing in this i was from the start i was very interested and very impressed by it like i know i only settled on the three star because my rating went down as my reading went on. So from the prologue chapter, I was hooked. Like what I wrote in my review is I challenge anyone to read the prologue chapter of this book and not want to read further. Like the writing of that chapter is very gripping and it will hook you and make you want to keep reading. Um, and there is very atmospheric writing 
that you see throughout, like just describing the cloisters where they work, like the museum that they work at. And I liked that. Um, you know, themes in this book I wrote down, we see a lot of like themes around academia and not feeling acceptance within like academia and those circles, like elite circles. Um, we see fate talked about often, and then also there's a lot of talk about tarot cards because that's what our main characters are studying. So where this book started to lose me was about 35% into this book, I started getting really bored and I felt like I was losing touch with the point of the story. I felt like there was like no plot in this book until way too far in. Um, so, you know, our main characters are studying these tarot cards throughout the story and it took me until almost 80% in to really grasp like what the point of that was, like what they were looking for to do with the tarot cards. Like I kept thinking there was going to be some magical element to them, but it just, it never came. And I had a tarot card phase. I have a ton of different decks, um, and I collected tarot cards. So I was excited for that aspect of this book. But I honestly found that to be one of the more boring parts whenever they were talking about the tarot cards. I just, it didn't feel like really fleshed out to me and I didn't connect to it. And that might have been, again, sometimes I'll say this, like it might have been because I listened to this on audio and I think sometimes you miss things listening on audio versus reading like words on a page. Um, so that could be my own issue. The other thing I really didn't like about the cloisters, and this might be a theme that you hear me saying, similar to what I just talked about with The Devil Makes Three, I did not like the romance in this. And sometimes I struggle with, with romance in books. I think it has to be done really well for me to enjoy it. And this, I did not enjoy it. Um, So this has like, there's kind of like a love triangle square sort of romance here where everybody wants to date each other thing. And I didn't, like, like I said, I don't particularly love romance in my books anyway. I just felt like this romance was particularly annoying. Also, I could not stand the character Leo, who was the, like, boyfriend. Not boyfriend, but, like, he is the love interest of, like, our main character. And so there's a lot of scenes with him. And honestly, I found him to be the most pretentious character in the entire book. Despite the fact that he is the only non-academic character in this book, like he doesn't work. He's like, he works as the gardener. So he is not in their like academia circle, but he is the most pretentious character in this entire book. Like he was so annoying to me. And anytime like our main character was describing him and like blushing over him, I'm like, this guy is, he didn't treat her very well either. So I don't know. I, I didn't see like the thing with him, like why she was so into him. Okay, so the biggest issue though with this book is I felt personally like it had major pacing issues. Like how I was saying that there was, felt like there was no plot for a good majority of the book or I was really losing point. I was losing touch with what the point of the story was. There is a twist that comes in at about 60% into this book that I think should have come a, a lot sooner, like right away because then Basically, the book starts to get interesting once this plot twist happens, about 60% in. But the book is so dull up until that point. And for me, it was like too little too late. Like, I don't think you should read up to 60% in a book and that's when it starts to get interesting. So, I, like I said, again, reading The Secret History by Donna Tartt, I can see so many parallels to The Cloisters. And, like, she tried, I think she tried to do, like her own way of that story like her own telling of that story but in a different way and I just think it had pacing issues there are some really good twists there's the last few pages there's a couple of really good twists that blew my mind and I did not see coming um but overall I just felt like a lot of this book was like a wasted opportunity because it focuses too much on the, these pointless romantic entanglements and I don't know. I, I would have liked to explore more of the relationship between the main character and the other female character of the group and their dynamic. I would have liked to see that more than the romance. Um, I was really conflicted on my rating between a three and a four because I thought it had really good elements to it and I really enjoyed the twist at the very end. Like that really impressed me. But I just, I thought it was too slow and with the bulk of the plot happening within the last 40% of the book, I didn't feel like I could forgive that. So that's why I settled on a three star for the Cloisters. 
The next book I have to talk about is White Horse by Erica T. Worth. This book follows an indigenous main character who has just been passed down this bracelet that used to be her mother's and when she puts this bracelet on she starts seeing like visions and seeing spirits um and she starts seeing very scary things like she's seeing ghosts and you know all sorts of different things and she's basically investigating what happened to her mom because her mom disappeared when our main character was a baby so she never knew her mother and so our book the book is following her um investigating what happened to her mother and what do these visions mean that are coming from this bracelet that she's wearing so this was another like conflicting rating um book rating for me like I originally had it at four stars and then I did lower it to three and I will go into why um overall I so this is was a debut from Erica T. Worth and I do think overall it was a successful book um I loved learning more about indigenous folklore like so the monster that we encounter I don't know if this is a spoiler but I want to talk about it because I think it's interesting and I've never heard of this this sort of creature before it's called the lofa the lofa is a malevolent ogre-like monster of Chickasaw folklore his name literally means flayer or skinner I did find that to be like a really terrifying creature and I liked learning like a new creature that I'd never heard of before um, and I also love getting an own voices perspective. There is some really good commentary in this book um, and it had really some really good spooky scenes and it was a really quick read. I read this in about like a day and a, a day and a half, like really quickly. Um, like I said, it has some really good commentary and important subject matter at the heart of the story, which has to do with missing and murdered indigenous women. Um, I think this novel really helps to shine a light on the subject that does not have enough widespread public awareness and we definitely don't talk about it enough or hear about it enough in the news. So this book I think really helped to shine a light on that. Um, the majority of the book I really loved our main character's perspective. Her voice was very easy to follow and read. Um, there is a subplot in this book of her cousin who has like a horrible marriage and it's I did find it to get tiring eventually like the marital issues of her cousin that kept coming back into the story and like you know our main character interacting with them but I did like how the main character refused to ever make excuses for like the cousin's husband she was very hard on him um, because he was being like terrible at times so there's a section of this book where um, she goes on a tour of the hotel from Stephen King's The Shining and so in this book she really likes Stephen King like she brings him up a few different times and how she'll be like reading his novels um but this portion of the book to me felt very awkward and off topic like I know that she really likes Stephen King um but I didn't understand why she was on the tour like in the middle of the book in the middle of the plot and what the significance was to the to the story ultimately like I just felt like that section was really random and I thought it just could have been cut out like I didn't understand why she was there also at the very end and this is why I lowered it ultimately to three stars there's a section at the very end that I personally found really problematic and just did not agree with did not understand why the author wrote it as such and it's like a one line bit basically our main character has sort of a reconciliation with the antagonist of the story and I felt like it was really wrong and it was totally against what her character stood for the entire book and it, it just came out of nowhere because she the entire book she's very like girl power women's rights like don't make excuses for men and then all of that goes down the toilet in one line and if you're interested in what I'm talking about I did film a vlog for White Horse where I go into the spoiler section so go ahead and check out that video because I don't want to get into spoilers in this, but if you want to know what I'm talking about, check out that vlog. As a whole, I think the story was really interesting, has important themes, and I will definitely check out more from the author in the future. Yeah, so I did enjoy that overall. The next book I have to talk about is Tripping Arcadia by Kit Mayquist. So this one, I was really excited for this book. I love a good eat the rich story. So um, a comparative example I have for that is if you've ever read The Escape Room by Megan Golden, um, that, the ending, that's like very much an eat, eat the rich story. 
Um, and this I thought was going to give me those same feels and by the end was going to give me that same like empowerment feeling, you know, but for that, you know, Tripping Arcadia had really like immense promise, but the execution was really lacking in my opinion. So to start, I thought the author did a really good job of depicting the debauchery that comes from obscene wealth and the drug abuse that is so prevalent in those like elite circles. I found myself disgusted, like often disgusted at the nauseating world of opulence that our main character finds herself caught in. And I didn't say what this is about. So our, the main character of this book, she has just recently, she's like a med school dropout. So she has student loans, she's living with her parents. So she is trying to find a job and she does end up finding a job as an assistant to a doctor who is like, um, like a live in doctor and to this very, very, very wealthy family, their son, he's like, um, he's like an adult though. The son lives there and he is very sick. And so they have a live in doctor who comes and brings him his medicine. And our main character is the assistant to that doctor. So she'll, you know, she starts bringing the medicine and such and helping take care of him. And then she starts taking on more responsibilities within the house and for the family. So um, they have these very, very crazy rich people parties, basically. And our main character gets asked to start helping and working at these parties that they put on. And the first one that she ends up working at and going to, she sees something there that kind of flips a switch in her and totally her whole motivations in life become centered on basically getting revenge. And you see why and you see how that plays out. Um, so the book did start off really slow in my opinion, like up until we get that revenge, that shift gear into a revenge story, which is about 30% 30, 30 into the book. Up until then, like I thought it was rather slow, a little bit boring. But at that point, I was rooting for the plot and I was like itching for some payoff. Like I was excited. Like I said, I really like those types of stories. I love revenge stories so much. Um, but I found like that payoff that I was looking for never really came. I also found myself confused at different points and I don't know if this just comes down to the writing but you know by 90% in I, I wrote in my notes that I really didn't understand still why the brother is so sick like you know the one that she's working for to she's working for the doctor to help with this brother it is explained why he like you know we should know like what is his illness and that's kind of a mystery throughout the whole thing like she doesn't know why he's sick um and what he's being medicated for. But it is explained, okay, towards the end. But even after the explanation, I was still confused. I was also confused by the wrap up in the ultimate conclusion. Like to me, it was all extremely convoluted. Um, it was really hard for me to like realistically envision what I was reading and see the actions unfolding as described. I don't know if the character motivations, I think it comes down to that, like if they were fleshed out enough for their actions to really make sense and for the plot to really make sense. Also, so, you know, on the cover, it says Tripping Arcadia, a gothic novel. To me, this was not a gothic novel. And I've also heard this pitched at times as dark academia or a little bit like dark academia leaning. And I 100% not dark academia at all, but I also didn't see the gothic vibes. And like I said, you might hear me say this a couple times because I listened to this on audio and was not reading the words on page. I think I may have missed some nuance and Maybe there was gothic vibes, like if I had read it physically, but I didn't get it at all. I don't know why it says a gothic novel. Um, there is a sapphic romance in this, and I love, also love a sapphic romance, but I disappointingly, okay, <laughs> and here's the theme that keeps coming back up again. Romance in books, it has to be done well. You know, in my opinion, like this wasn't done well. It didn't work for me. I found the relationship between these two women very cheesy, very shallow. I honestly thought it could have been cut out. Like it didn't need to be there. The chemistry between them was so flat and I was just, I was never convinced by the relationship. So I just didn't, I didn't like it. It was just a, an extra subplot that didn't need to be there. Overall, despite me like giving a mostly critical review right now, I, I didn't think the book was bad. Like I liked aspects of it. And at times I was really hooked in by the plot. Um, 
I would definitely check out more from this author in the future because I think they have really great ideas. I just thought that Tripping Arcadia, it was, you know, the two-dimensional characters paired with the confusing explanations and ending that just made this a miss for me. All right, so moving on to our four-star books. The first one I have to talk about is The Paris Apartment by Lucy Foley. So I was actually really surprised by how much I enjoyed this, giving this four stars. Um, I also read this book um, in that challenge where I was trying to read authors that I had given five stars in the past. I loved The Guest List by Lucy Foley. I did not like The Hunting Party at all. Um, so like I said, I was really surprised by how much I enjoyed this, especially from the plot. It sounds like, it doesn't sound like the most gripping mystery. We're following our main character who is going to stay with her brother who lives in Paris. And when she gets there, um, he's gone. He doesn't answer the intercom when she's like ringing. And she's basically asking everyone like, do you know where my brother is? Have you seen him? Somebody lets her into the building and she does like get into his apartment and he's gone. Um... But like none of his things are gone, you know, like all of his things are still at the apartment. And so we basically are following her investigating what happened to what happened to her brother and kind of questioning like everybody who lives in this apartment building. Um, so I felt like from the prologue chapter of this, I was hooked. Like it gets off to a really great ominous start. The vibes stay creepy and mysterious. So I really love that. I also felt like this was very different from Lucy Foley's other books and I also thought that these were her most interesting characters yet. Like um, something I said about the hunting party was it felt just like the guest list, like a repeat of the guest list just in a different setting. But the Paris of Hermit was very different from the other two books and I really enjoyed that. I loved the apartment setting of this book. I really enjoyed how everyone was a suspect and it all pretty much took place at the apartment building. I thought that was so fun. It reminded me a bit of Riley Sager's Lock Every Door. Although I thought the execution in this was way much better. Like I didn't, I'm not a fan of Lock Every Door by Riley Sager. So if you liked that book though, you would probably like this as well because it has similar vibes. I gave it a four though and not a five because I felt like aspects of this book were very predictable. Although there were at least two big twists at the very end that I did not see coming. So I liked that. Overall, I thought this was a super quick, thrilling read with a lot of good suspense. So if you love thrillers, I would definitely recommend The Paris Apartment by Lucy Foley. Um, the next book I have to talk about is Bad Cree by Jessica Johns. This one, I just finished this one and I am still kind of stuck between a four star and a three star. I, I'm settling on a four for now, but I might change it and I'll go into why. So um, this book is also follows an indigenous main character and she is Cree, which I had to look that up because I, I did not know. And I think that is... Um, indigenous people native to Canada. So I think this book actually takes place in Canada and it kind of, it has a strong focus and eye on dream magic. So our main character, she, right from the start, she has this dream where there's like crows following her in her dream. And when she wakes up, she brings a crow, like the crow's head back from her dream. So you know what, that kind of reminds me of the Raven Boys because that sort of exact thing happens. But there is a strong focus on dream magic throughout this entire book. Um, her sister died and she starts having dreams of her sister and her sister, she's trying to figure out, I mean, they know how she died. She died from a brain aneurysm, but she starts, our main character starts to think like there's something else going on here. It wasn't just that there's something else that happened because I keep getting these dreams and her sister's like speaking her, to her in her dreams. So the main character, she goes back to her hometown and basically the entire novel, she is interacting with her family and reconnecting with them, you know, cause she left after her sister died and she doesn't really speak to her family anymore. So she's reconnecting with them and trying to piece together what happened to her sister. So why this book I'm kind of stuck between a three and a four star is because I think the synopsis is very cool. I love the dream magic aspect. I think that is so cool that she is like going into her dreams and taking things out of her dreams. And her dreams are also like a bit 
like prophetic prophetic and like they're giving her answers of what happened you know and her sister speaking to her and she's piecing together what happened kind of like from her dreams and I, I love that I I love analyzing dreams um so that aspect was very cool but to me the plot was very meandering and I wrote by 30 or by 20 percent uh, no okay so by 20 percent in I made a note and I said I can't say I'm really enjoying this like a lot of the backstory to me felt very random and really to me it felt random but I can see what the author was doing like I don't think it is random because I can see that the author was trying to set the scene of we're seeing about the racial injustice that this fam like cr the Cree people have endured and we're getting like generational trauma and we're seeing family ties between these women so I see what she was doing, but there's a lot of backstory and by 30% in, I was still feeling like mid about this book, you know? I just, I wasn't getting along with the pacing because it just is such a focus on the main character going back to her hometown and reconnecting with her family. So there's a lot of that where we're focusing on, you know, the joy, them, the joy and the grief of what has happened to them in their time like ever since her sisters died and how they've all dealt with their grief and it was just a little bit slow for me I guess and at times I, I was just getting a little bit bored and I wasn't completely like connecting with it or I wasn't like really interested to keep reading so um in this book similar to White Horse by Erica T. Worth where we're also following like indigenous folklore, this has some of that same, we're following Cree, like a Cree folk monster. And I'm not gonna go into what it, I know I said what it was for White Horse, um, but I don't wanna spoil, I, I'm trying not to spoil anything for you guys. But there is, you know, we do talk about some indigenous folklore in this as well and I thought that th that was so interesting like I love that I love learning about new cultures and this different monster that was very scary um I also thought and wrote in my notes that this I think would make a really really good scary movie there are there's a lot of imagery in this of there's this scene that our main character keeps reliving and dreaming about and thinking about this moment that she wishes that she could change and she knows that everything kind of like changed at this moment where her sister and her cousin run into this these woods and the main character and the other cousin are like standing at, on the outside of the woods and they're looking in there and they don't want to follow them. So they go around them and wait for them to come out the other side. But our main character is thinking like she keeps going back to that moment over and over again of them watching them run into the woods and their paths diverging and they don't follow them in and they don't go like help them, you know, and just that moment like I can see it so clearly like they're hearing them in there and like the wind in the trees and like their hair blowing and I don't know, I, I think that would make like really good imagery like in a movie. So overall, I... I loved portions of this. Like I really love the dream sequences. I did, like I said, I had an issue with a little bit pacing. Like, I don't know, for me, some of this book was very like, it was unvaried. Like our main character hanging out with her family and doing family activities. I, I totally see why the author put that in there. So I wouldn't say, you know, take it out. Like, I think it has a point and it's purposeful. But to me, it just got, I wasn't quite fascinated by that. Um, like I get, I get why it's in there. So it's a three, it's a four. I don't know. It has a great premise. It's stuck in the middle for me. Like I, I'm stuck at a four. So yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I think a lot of people would like this. So let's move on. The next book I have to talk about is Several People Are Typing by Calvin Kazook. And I did write this book four stars. I really, really enjoyed this. Like this was a five star until the very end and you okay that's another theme you're gonna hear me say a couple times this i i was loving it like i was dying of laughter okay let me just say what this book is about so this book takes place entirely within slack conversations so i've never used slack we've i've always used microsoft teams which is a, you know, messaging system for like professional environments. And Slack, I think, is just another version of that. So you might have used Slack for 
you know, work. This is entirely taking place within Slack conversations between like work associates. So they work for this like advertising company, I believe. And um, one character, he starts messaging and telling everyone that he is stuck in Slack. Like his consciousness has been uploaded into Slack and he keeps telling them like, I'm stuck in here. Um, and of course, of course, nobody believes him. So I don't know. It's, it's really interesting. It's such a weird way to tell a story, but I thought it was so fun and so relatable, especially if you work or have worked in like an office environment or like professional like off office where you use these sort of systems. Like it is really funny. And some of the like dialogue and terminology and verbiage that they use, like, like what you use, like email language sort of, you know, like it's really funny and very relatable. So like the guy who has his consciousness uploaded into the web, like Slack, you know, um, he obviously he keeps working from home, right? So every day he's working from home and people are starting to get mad at him because they're like, oh, you're taking advantage of the work from home policy and you're going to ruin it for the rest of us. But I'm just, I wanted to talk about like one specific part where I like burst out laughing and I made a note about it because it was so funny to me. Like, so the characters were chatting and in their like group chat with the managers and everybody and they were just like one character after the next was like oh you know my kids are sick today so i'm gonna be w i'm gonna be wfh and the next person was like oh i hate to pile on but yeah my car isn't starting so i'm gonna be wfh today and the next character was like <laughs> was like oh i just fell down the stairs so i'm wfh today and basically everybody was working from home except like one guy he's like am i the only one coming to the office today so i, I don't know it was just so funny and relatable to me like just all these characters being like, oh yeah, I'm working from home today. Like whether they really are sick or not, I just, I just found it so entertaining and relatable. There's lots of commentary in here and I, I need to analyze it more um, because I basically read this book in one sitting and then just breezed on and started, started another book. So I didn't like get enough time to analyze this. And this is, I also haven't written my review yet on Goodreads for it. And that's when I, have time to sit there and analyze and form my thoughts but there's commentary on here in here I think on how when you work from home like well that's the thing is like I'm trying to figure out what was the author trying to say with this book um I think for one like how when when you're working from home it's kind of like you're always on the clock like or you some people do more work working from home than they do in the office or they might not take as many breaks they might get on and stay stay on later so i kind of thought there was commentary on that like spending more time working um when you're working from home versus when you are in the office like especially since the pandemic obviously a lot of businesses have moved to remote work like um currently I am fully remote so I I work from home so I, that's another thing like I found this very relatable so I think there's com there was commentary on that also like endless scrolling and the internet sadness like there is this part about the sunset like there's a sunset on the cover of this book and there's a part in there about sadness that um we have when we look on the internet and there's just all these horrible things happening that you have to look away from because if you didn't you know you just you can't hold like all that pain and horrible things that are going on every day in the world um and you have to look away from it like a sunset um and i think there was commentary in this about depression because one of these characters is also she keeps hearing like this howling so every time they go to her she's talking about oh it's so loud like does anybody hear that there's wolves outside like it's so i think i'm that's one of the things like i'm trying to understand like what was he trying to say with that like what was he representing or trying to like you know say with it and i feel like it might be commentary on depression and especially in these very professional office work environments it, i feel like where we're always, uh, you know, behind our screens. I felt like it was talking about depression. I don't know. I need to analyze it more and clear my thoughts on this one. But it was it was very interesting to think about. Um, I loved. Okay, this this whole talk about this one is gonna be very random. But I loved the workplace and company. I loved how the characters like there was one conversation where they were talking about how 
the workplace and company culture is very similar to being in a cult. Like the language that you use, like how we're all a family. Ugh, I hate that. Like, I just, I thought that was so relatable. Like I said, so much of this is very relatable. Also, oh my God. So I don't know, like if you guys use Slack, like I said, I've always used Microsoft Teams. I've never used Slack. But the characters were talking about this thing called Dusty Stick. And I had to look it up. I was like, what the heck is Dusty Stick? So if you use Slack and you know about this emoji or you don't, like look it up. It is so weird. It's, okay, I'll pop a picture up. It looks like a stick with like spaghetti on it. Like it's so funny. But how they were using Dusty Stick, like how, when they would use that emoji, it was kind of like an inside joke between everybody. And it was just hilarious to me. And so I listened to this on audio. I didn't read it physically. Um, and narrator would just be like, you know, it would say whatever they said. And then it would be like Dusty Stick. And it would just be like, so I don't know. Every time the narrator would say Dusty Stick, it was just so funny to me. So I wrote down, this is truly incredible. Like I was just relating to it, laughing so hard. Like I loved it up to this point. Um, okay, so here in my notes, I wanted to look this quote up so I could like get actually like word for word what it said, but it was again talking about the sunset. I don't know. There was just this quote in there that, that I really loved where the main character, he, he was talking about ephemera, which I looked that up, things that exist or are used or enjoyed for only a short period of time which is a lot like internet the internet and things that you know we're scrolling and we see a picture and we enjoy it and then we move on you know and so it's very things that are very fleeting um and there's this quote they that they say in there and it says the digital is fleeting like a sunset but the scraps of ourselves we fling into the ether will outlive us like the sun so I don't know, it's just so interesting, like more things to analyze. And I really liked that quote. Um, there was another part that I burst out loud laughing. Um, I don't wanna, it's kind of a spoiler. So I'm not, I'll say what it is, but I'm not gonna give any, uh, well, you know, no, I won't say it. I'll put it in my review on Goodreads. So if you guys follow me on Goodreads, um, if I ever have like spoilery thoughts, I do a spoiler section at the very bottom. So I will put this quote down there because it was so funny. It made me laugh so hard. Um, okay, so why this, I was, like I said, I was loving it. I wrote, this is truly incredible. Like this was a five star and I was so excited to, you know, see what was going to happen. But why this went down in stars for me was the ending. Like the ending was anticlimactic. And I felt like there was a lot of loose ends. And I will also, also put those in my spoiler section on Goodreads because there's a lot of loose ends that didn't add up for me. And maybe that's because I need to sit there and like analyze this book further. I don't know, it was just kind of an open ending. Um, overall though, it was very, very fun. Just the very end is anticlimactic. So I don't know, I don't regret reading it at all though. Like I had a good time with this one and I really, really enjoyed it. The next book I have to talk about is The Hacienda by Isabel Can Canis? Cans. Um, I really enjoyed this book. This was so close to being a new favorite of the year. I, I really, really loved it. But the ending for me was a thing. It was just too open. So this book is about our main character who marries a man um, and leaves her home and goes to live with this man that she just married. And when she moves into his big, like, manor, um, the house is weird. And weird things start happening. And she's very isolated there and dealing with it on her own. So she gets a priest to come out and, try and bless the house. And basically, it follows the two of them trying to figure out what's going on with this house and make it safe for her to live there. So there was a lot of things I enjoyed about this book. Um, I love haunted house stories. I love anything paranormal. So that really like hit the nail on the head for me. I felt also felt like head over heels for the vibes of this book. Like it has amazing gothic vibes. The writing is heady and atmospheric and lush. And like I could feel the heat and dust of the Hacienda that the story takes place at like so vividly. Um, I love the writing of this. There is a quote that I jotted down that I really enjoyed. It says, our relationship was founded on one thing and one thing only. My world was a dark windowless room and he was a door. So that was her, the main character talking about how, basically why she married the man that she did. And it just really represented and 
like how isolated she is in her situation um, when all these scary things are happening to her like she really doesn't have anyone to turn to I loved the characters in this book they are lifelike from the very first page I felt connected to them which is like the opposite of what I said about some of these other books like Tripping Arcadia where the characters felt very two-dimensional and flat to me no these characters were like vivid you know like I was so connected to them I I loved both the main character the girl and the priest Andreas I loved his character um this definitely so this is the exception to the rule of everything I've said in this video this is a gothic romance and like I said I often have issue with romance in my books but this book did it right this book I I connected to it so much like this book was the outlier so there is so much angst between these two main characters um it is stunning and it is evocative and this story is like dripping with angst and it caught me and I was just completely hooked. It's haunting, it's romantic, it's atmospheric. My biggest problem with it though was the ending which was very frustrating. It is a very open ending um, and I was kind of heartbroken by it. Like it is just, I was so into these two characters and I needed more closure from the ending so overall I would still highly recommend it it has like all the makings of a five-star book it really does um if possible too I did put this in my notes I listened to a gothic dark academia playlist while I read this and it like just enhanced my reading experience so like if possible do that because it just I don't know this book is going to stick with me for sure um, the next book I have to talk about is The Spite House by Johnny Compton. This this is the last book I just read most recently um, and I settled on a four star for this and this is another thing I keep saying but this was a book that for throughout the majority of the book I was like oh my god this is a five star. This is a new favorite and then we get to the end and I'm like and it goes on to four. So that's basically what happened to this, what happened with this book. Um, the synopsis, we're following the main character, Eric, who is a father of two girls. Um, they're Stacy and Des. And Stacy is a very young, she's like six, and Des is like just turned 18. And we see them, they just left home. They've run away from their home. And they're very like, uh, they're like on the run, but we don't know from what. We don't know what circumstance led them to running away from home. Um, and so Eric is desperate for work and he kind of has to get like under the table work, you know, like he can't get like a regular job where he's going to need to have like a background check and all that because they're on the run. So he finds this ad for this older, very wealthy woman is wants somebody to come stay in this haunted house that she has um and she's gonna pay them a hundred thousand dollars to stay there and prove the existence of supernatural the supernatural um so that's basically what happens he takes this ad and he agrees to stay there with his two young girls and try to prove the existence of the supernatural in this haunted house um so yeah like I said I there was so much about this that I loved I loved the descriptions of the house so so it's called the spite house and I had just if anyone doesn't know because I personally didn't know I had to look up what is a spite house so a spite house is houses that were built basically to spite someone else so they often have very bizarre architecture I'll go ahead and pop up a picture of one or a few they might have very bizarre architecture so they might be built like in between like two houses like in the little space that's left or somebody it basically was built to spite somebody else um so like if say you sold the land like somebody you got, had a neighbor move in and they built like a, something you didn't like next door and then so you built this big structure to block their view like that would be called a spite house so that is where the story takes place at i love the descriptions of the house um Right from the start, I was hooked because the stakes are really high for this family. Like the lifestyle that they're living, there is instant tension and suspense because like I said, they're on the run. So from the start, it's like really, it hooks you and it's interesting because you wanna know like, are they gonna be okay? Like where they go next? Are they gonna find work? What's gonna happen? There's also um, 
a lot of danger that comes from racial prejudice because this family is down in Texas. So they are like traveling through these small towns of Texas. There's some really scary scenes where um, they're interacting with people or, you know, keeping an eye out for people who are like, there's this moment where the two girls are at a diner and the older one is like looking around them and saying like, is anybody looking at us? Like, I have to be careful in here. And it's very scary. Um, like it, the dangers of being black, like anywhere in America, um, anywhere, not just in America, you know, and especially in small Southern towns. So that was really scary. And I, and I was really hooked because I found this book and the story fascinating. There's some writing in here I really love that I wrote down. I wrote down a one quote that said, the past has an echo. Um, I liked that. There was another quote, um, the house is skinny because it hasn't eaten enough. Like uh, the little girl, Stacy, she, she is very odd. Like we can tell right from the start that she's odd, something strange with her and she has some sort of like ability, you know? Um, but we don't know what it is, but we know there's something strange about her. And when the dad is like getting this ad for the spite house to go stay there and like, you know, get all the money, um, she sees a picture of the house and she's like, oh, the house is skinny because it hasn't eaten enough. She's like, don't be afraid of it. That's why it's skinny because it hasn't eaten enough. And that is like some really crazy, cool imagery, like to describe it, like why it's, it has such weird architecture. Um, I thought like it was really, um, what's the word? It was very like engrossing watching this father trying to protect his children from these external forces, right? So, you know, we have the racial prejudice of the towns that they're traveling through, whatever they're escaping from in their past. And then once they get to the house and they're dealing with like these forces within the house. So there's all these external like pressures that he's trying to protect, like outside of his control, he's trying to protect his children. And I found that just really, really engrossing. Like I said, I was hooked by this book. Um, so one reason why it was a four star and not a five star is I do wish that we could have focused more on Eric's point of view and his two girls, like the two daughters. And because there are a lot of other POVs and this is a short book, this book is under 300 pages. So there's quite a few other POVs that we do see within the book. And to me, like whenever somebody else was narrating, it was just them gossiping about the house or about the woman, the very wealthy older woman who owns the house. And it didn't really add anything to the book for me. And it wasn't interesting. Like they had barely, they didn't have stakes, you know, but anytime we were following Eric or the daughters, it was like gripping and intense and suspenseful because you were scared for them. Um, I also loved something that they describe in this book when talking about the spite house and why somebody would build a spite house. And, and somebody says something like, when you can't make yourself feel better, you make your life about trying to make others feel worse. And I thought that was like a very poignant way to say that. Um, after finishing this book, a note I had was I would have liked a little bit more resolution from the ending. Um, I don't know. I, I wanted a little bit more from the ending. Like the, the concept of this book is so cool. Um, and a great setting I thought to explore these themes in, but there's not a ton of focus like in the spite house. Like there's not a ton of scenes in, within the house. Um, I would have liked more of that. I would have liked more scenes within the house. I would have liked only perspective between Eric and the daughters. And I would have liked a little bit more closure from the ending, a little bit more resolution. Like I wasn't super satisfied with the ending. Like it's a little bit of, it's not like the happiest ending ever, you know? And books don't have to have a happy ending, 100%, they do not. But I don't know, I, this book, this story, I was a little bit let down. Like I wanted a little bit more of a happy ending and that's just me. That's just me. And like I said, books do not have to have a happy ending 100%. I get that. So moving on to the next one, moving on to my five stars. Okay, the first five star I have is Lost in the Moment and Found by Shauna McGuire. This is, I believe, the eighth book in the Wayward Children series. And yeah, I love this series. So um, if you don't know what the series is, it basically follows children who find doors and they go cross into the door like they go into the door and with on the other side is like this other magical mystical world think like alice of wonderland you know like you fall down a rabbit hole into this other crazy world so this book is the eighth book in the series everyone follows a different character um 
So this is basically a kid who goes through a different door and we follow like what the world is, what is her circumstances. Um, <clears throat> this book, I really enjoyed this book. My favorite one in the Wayward Children series is In an Absent Dream. Um, what's her name? What's her name? In an Absent Dream. Lund Lundy's point of view, is that her name Lundy? That's my favorite one in the series. But this one, this one I liked. I liked this one. Well, I loved it. It was a five star. Something I said towards the end, and this is something I feel about this series is so I don't typically view reading as like a form of escape. I know some pe some people say like, you know, that's what they love about reading is it's like an escape, right? Um, I don't I don't think of reading that way. Like, I, I don't know, I never view it that way. But this series, I can see, like, I can see what people mean when they say reading. I love reading because it's a form of escape for me. That is, like, the biggest, best pitch I can say for this series. It is the most purest form of escape. Like, I, I feel it, you know, I feel like a kid again reading a book and you're going on this adventure and you're, like, immersed in the story. And I don't know it I, because I love Alice in Wonderland so much. I love the book. I love any retelling of the book or any of the films. Um, and this just gives me so much Alice in Wonderland energy. So I love that about it as well. Every book in this series is magic and has value and they just they make me feel so sentimental and maybe it's because they remind me of Alice in Wonderland which is like a sentimental thing for me. There's something you can get lost in and like let the anxieties of real life just melt away for a short moment in time. And that's something I really appreciate about the series. This book in particular, Lost in the Moment and Found, I will say is one of the much, one of the darker books of this series. Um, there is a lot of gaslighting and abuse that we see. Some of the subject matter is very disturbing. And the gaslighting in this is infuriating. Like we see basically every one of the characters of these books, there's something going on in their real life that they're, they want to run away from. And when this, this door comes up at the perfect time for them, because it's like an escape, right? An escape from their present and their circumstance. So we see what is causing this tent, this like, um, what is causing this conflict in this main character's life that she finds this door for, you know? And it's bad. It really is. Um, it's basically a tale of how adults, children can't always trust adults. You know, children are raised like, you know, listen to what this adult says. But this book is kind of about losing your childhood and losing your innocence. And some once that thing is lost, you can't get it back. Um, so one of my biggest pet peeves in books, in anything, anything, oh gosh, I can't stand it, is when grown-ups do not believe kids. So if you've ever read the Small Spaces series by Katherine Arden, you will have a clear picture of what I'm talking about right now. Like that, I can't stand it. So the first half of this book was basically, I, I don't know, was it the first half? I don't know, maybe the first third was a bit basically about how the main character, the daughter, like she is getting pressures she is getting sort of groomed from the stepfather okay and her mother she, the main character is like her mother isn't believing her and the the man the stepfather is gaslighting this daughter and it's so horrible it's so horrible to read and I just hated how the mother was not believing the daughter not taking her side and and you know getting her pushed into this position where she had to run away it was horrible and so it was infuriating to read. The gaslighting was infuriating. It was a difficult first quarter of the book. Um, also though, I listened to this on audio and this is a thing I always say, audio narrators doing children's voices. It is the worst, it is the worst. So <laughs> she does like a children's voice and I can't, couldn't stand it. Um, I would recommend reading this physically if possible because that very much frustrated me but once we were past like once she goes into the door I was so into it like I loved this world that our main character finds herself in I love the point and the moral of the story like what she encounters and uh, I this is a really good one this is one of my favorites in the series it dealt with really important heavy topics in a very delicate and sensitive way I also love the easter eggs in this book in references to the other books in the series like we get references to the other characters and worlds and it is so cool 
it's a treat every time I get to read a new a new book in this series and I am eagerly awaiting the next one. Um, the next book I have to talk about is Ghost Eaters by Clay McLeod Chapman. Clay Chapman. Ooh, five star. This is a favorite of the year. Loved it. This book was totally unexpected. Did not expect this to be a favorite of the year. I have not been able to stop thinking about this book since I finished it. I just really enjoyed it. So Ghost Eaters follows the main character, Erin, who um, her, her ex-boyfriend has just passed away uh, from an overdose. And she learns about this new drug called Ghost that when you take it, it allows you to communicate with the dead um, but it comes with some very particular side effects so what I gathered from this from ghost eaters was it's a look at toxic relationships and how hard it is to let go of toxic relationships um and get out of them because Aaron is so like hooked to this guy right and she keeps enabling him and helping him and in his addiction and every time that he gets in a bind he comes to her and needs her to pull him out right and help him and when he dies she feels hooked to him still like she needs closure from his death um and it's so hard for her to let go it's about drugs and addiction um how hard it is to break an addiction and like i said not just an addiction to drugs but an addiction to the people in our lives and the toxic relationships in our lives it's a lot about desperation and the way that society looks at people who who have addiction not only at but through people who have addiction like they're ghosts and I love that sort of analogy um there's some really vivid scenes in this book really great imagery it's super creepy it's really fast-paced um also I so I listened to this on audio the narrator of this book was excellent I loved it she was able to portray these characters emotions so well her pacing during the tense scenes of this was so good like just her timing her pacing like reading them it was amazing I got frustrated at times and I think anyone would reading this book may get frustrated because the way that the ex-boyfriend continues to take from the main character, even in death, oh, it was frustrating. The way that she let someone who was so not worth it spiral her life out of control, it just felt like, it was frustrating to read about, but I can see why that was a little bit the point of what the author was trying to say. Although it was like a tough portrayal to read at times. Um, I felt like there was a very sharp shift in tone in this book about, in, in plot, about 70% in. And it was a little bit abrupt. So here's the thing. I'm not saying this book was perfect. You know, I don't know if it's going to be for everyone. But for me, I just really enjoyed it. Um... It's not perfect because it is shift and abrupt and I was a little bit thrown off by the story and after reflecting though once I finished I did appreciate the shift in tone and I thought ultimately the climax of this was so good and it was like a riot like I was it was crazy um there is some hilarious lines that made me laugh out loud there's one line that absolutely killed me like the main character she's during the climax, there's this part where she says, I never want to have kids as long as I effing live. And oh my god, I burst out laughing. Like, that line and scene is so funny. Like, seriously, the last 10% of this book is so crazy. And it's so satisfying. Um, It just solidified this as a favorite. Like, the ending. This was a book where, like, a lot of these were the ending kind of ruined it and took it down a star. This was a book where the ending bumped it up for me and made this a new favorite because I loved it so much. I also love the title of the book, Ghost Eaters, and the double meaning of this book. I'm not going to go into it because I think that's a little bit of a spoiler. But the title does have a double meaning and I love that. I think it, I just thought that it was so clever. Overall, for me, it was super enjoyable read with some seriously creepy moments. It made me think, it made me laugh, it made me feel. I I was analyzing this book so much, you know, like like I said, I haven't been able I haven't been able to stop thinking about this book since I finished it. So I really enjoyed that. The next book I have to talk about is This Thing Between Us by Gus Moreno. This was another five-star book. This book is 
uh, basically a character study on grief. It follows the main character who has just, his wife has just died and he is processing her death pretty much. And that's basically the synopsis I'm going to get for this. It's engrossing. It's vivid. It captures a moment in time of such unthinkable grief with such like poignancy like it is really really well written so also this book is definitely a character study more than you know a lot of plot it's a study on loss and sorrow and the writing in this is beautiful like it's the kind of book that it's very depressing um and every time every time you think it can't get worse it does there is a paranormal aspect to this book so it has something in here that you know it has like a haunted tech technology um aspect to this book there's this device that's called an itza that's basically like the fictional version of an alexa and that is kind of what kicks the book off and kicks the plot off but it's not hugely important to the story and i think that's kind of like a lot of times this book is pitched that way as like a haunted alexa but I wouldn't go into this book expecting it to be about haunted technology because that is like a smaller portion of this. Um, there's other specul speculative elements and sort of like cosmic horror elements that is more central to the plot. So don't go into this expecting it to just be about a haunted Alexa. Um, I also feel like this book would make an amazing book club pick because there is a ton of symbolism and layers to this story. It's a very trippy read with heavy allegory that leaves you thinking and analyzing long after finishing. Like there's so much that you could analyze about this, like what this means. I feel like everything has double meaning in this book. This was another book similar to Ghost Eaters where I really love the title. Um, and feel like the title, I love when the title is, is clever, right? And it has a lot of, you get to a point in the story where you, like the title clicks and makes sense to you. And there is this inclusion in the book and in the plot, um, about this wall. And I'm not going to go into everything about what it is, but there is this wall that our characters start seeing and in the story. And I just think that that title is so clever, this thing between us, because I felt like it was talking about this wall that is in the story. Like it has a deeper meaning, like the thing between them, like him and, and his wife. Um, it's just an interesting thought. Like you have to read it. You'd have to read it to get to this point where the character sees this wall and the significance of it within the book. Um, but it's just super interesting, like that title choice. Um, yeah, I really, really liked that book. The next book I have to talk about is The London Seance Society by Sarah Penner. I loved this. This book, I gave it five stars. Um, so I was in, like I said, I was in a reading slump in February, bad. And this book like kicked me out of that reading slump. Like it was just such a quick, easy, whatever, throw it on, breeze through it sort of book. So for that reason, like, you know, it's not a favorite of the year or anything, but it was just, it was easy and fun. And it was like exactly what I needed at exactly the right time. So that's a lot of what reading, like enjoyment in reading, I think sometimes is, is like, Sometimes you can read a book and at that time it might be like a two star, right? But if you had read it at a different point in your life or if you were in a different mood when you read it or, you know, it might have been like a totally different thing. So I think that's what this book was for me. Like it was just found me at like the perfect time. It was just what I needed. So basically this book is about the main character. She, um, I know I'm not really giving names. Like I just keep saying the main character is because I read so many books and I forget the names of the main characters so I just know they're the main character but yeah so she her sister has just died um and she's she goes to work for this woman who conducts seances um and she's basically working for this woman hoping that this woman will eventually help her conduct a seance to contact her dead sister and figure out what happened to her and 
basic okay so what what then happens is um there is a death within the london seance society their like president of the society has just died and the woman that the main main character is like mentoring under um they are asked to come to london and help investigate what happened to this man and perform a seance and see figure out why he died so like i said i basically threw this audio on and listen to it without any pressure. Sometimes I put pressure on myself, you know, like I have to finish this book by this time, scheduled, re regimented sort of reading, like hurry up, finish this, cause I gotta get on to the next one, you know? But I didn't do any of that. I listened without any pressure and it really helped me get out of that reading slump. Like it was just, to me, this book was like a palate cleanser. Like this book really isn't very action packed. And it is historical fiction. And that's interesting because typically I do not like historical fiction at all. I'm working on a vlog right now. Um, I'm reading seven new releases. And some of the books that I've talked about in this video will be talked about in and read in that vlog. But I just recently, I just finished a brand new book called Wayward. I can't even remember who the author is of that book. But I didn't like it at all. I've, I'll talk about it more in the vlog. But... <clears throat> That book was historical fiction heavy and that is a perfect example why, I don't know, it didn't work for me like and that was historical fiction but for some reason this one did. I don't know like it just found me at the right time. Um, it's not too action packed. It's, it. I would call this a cozy mystery because I don't know, it, like I said, there's not a ton of action but it's like a cozy mystery. It just is a cozy mystery, okay? It's easy to follow, it was easy to read, and I was really interested in the mystery aspect, like trying to figure out what happened to the sister and what happened to the president of the London Seance Society. Um, the ending was wild, and to me it was satisfying. Also, there is a sapphic element in here, which I really loved. Um, this book kept my attention and actually made me want to keep reading. Also, I did not like Sarah Penner's debut novel, um, The Lost Apothecary. So I went into this book with very low expectations, but I ended up pleasantly surprised by it. So I wouldn't go into this expecting like a ton of thrilling action, but if you're looking for an easy read with like a captivating mystery and a fun ending, I think that this is a great recommendation. Okay, oh God, I only have two books left. This is a very long video. So the next two though, I think, oh, you know, I loved Ghost Eaters too. These two are some of my favorites of the month with along with Ghost Eaters. Um, so the next book I have to talk about is The Writing Retreat by Julia Bartz. Five stars. This book will be in the vlog that I said I'm currently working on. Um, so the synopsis. This is a weird one. So it follows uh, a couple different women who have been selected to go on this very exclusive writing retreat with this famous um, female horror author. And on this retreat, they're all going to be writing a novel and she's going to be kind of like mentoring them, editing their works, giving them feedback and helping them like improve as writers. And when they leave the retreat, they should all have like a novel. But when they go to the writing retreat, um, the woman, this like horror author, she has very strange methods of inspiring them and working with them and some weird creepy stuff starts happening. So... <clears throat> From the start, from the beginning, I was very much enjoying it from the start. I love the atmosphere and the narration. The concept of the writing retreat, like going to stay at this place, like this, her house pretty much, and being mentored by their favorite horror author, like that was so cool. And that sounds so fun to me to go away somewhere and have no other focus than writing like every day wake up and I'm going to write and I'm living with my favorite author and she is going to like edit my book like that sounds so cool there is a lot of like uh mind games basically in here like I want to there's a lot of mind games played between the the women who are selected um in power struggles which was really interesting to read and like analyze the dynamic between the characters. There's also like a story within a story because like I said how they're all writing a novel. Um, portions of this book are dedicated to the main character writing her novel and we follow like we see what she's writing. Um, 
I loved the characters. I, I mean, the characters aren't like great people. Like I wouldn't say any of them are great people, but they're very full and complicated. And I love that. Especially complicated female characters and radical female characters. Like I love that. Um, and these characters are all that. They're very gray, like morally gray, but they're all so interesting. Um, they're so interesting and you'll dislike some of them and but you'll be interested in reading about them and interested in what's going on. Um, <clears throat> there is some wild twists in this book. And I think that like I have seen some very negative reviews coming in for this. And I think that is a problem that people are having with this is there is some wild twists. The ending is wild. And like, Describe this book in one word, bonkers, okay? Because the ending is crazy and the twist is weird. Um, and it's unbelievable, okay? This book is not like, um, it is unbelievable. Like, it's not realistic. That's what I'm trying to say. This book is not very realistic what happens, but it's a fun ride. Um, it's a fun ride. There is like gaslighting we see. There's unreliable narration. It's suspenseful, it's, surpri it's surprising and twisty. This, what I'm about to say, may not hit home for everybody. But for me, this book was refreshing as just anything, you know? Like for me, this was so, this was so refreshing. I want more thrillers like this, okay? That do not revolve around cheating men, horrible men, nasty men, men, men committing acts of violence against women. There are almost no men char men characters even within this book to begin with. I think there are one, I think there's one male character, two in the entire book and they're on page for four pages total. Like this book is about women, okay? And women who are complicated and dangerous and you know, like give me more female villains, right? Like I want to read about female villains and oh, like that's what I'm saying. I don't know if this is going to hit home for everyone because I'm just so tired, you guys. I am so, 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 so tired of books about horrible, nasty, despicable, terrible men who do terrible things to women, okay? And the sexual violence perpetrated against women. I know people, some people's favorite books contain these themes, right? And I'm not, there's nothing wrong with that, but I'm so tired of them. I'm so sick and tired of them. And I don't want to read about it anymore. I don't. I want more thrillers like this. Okay. So I loved it. So this book really worked for me. Um, like I said, it's unbelievable. It's not realistic, but it's a wild ride. It's gripping. It's unput downable. Absolutely. I really liked this. It, this might end up being a favorite of the year because this is another one that I haven't been able to just stop thinking about since I finished it. I just really enjoyed it. It worked for me. Okay, last book. We are almost done. I've been talking forever. Favorite book of March. New favorite of the year. New favorite of all time. Sundial by Catriona Ward. Sundial absolutely stunned me. Absolutely. So good. Okay. Before I go any further, major trigger warnings for this book. If you pick this up, check out trigger warnings. We have domestic abuse and animal cruelty. Portions of this book are very disturbing to read. So 100% go into this with caution. I think it's important. I, I personally think it's extremely important to voice trigger, triggers in books, okay? Because I'm somebody who can get very triggered by things and I like to know. So yeah. Check those out before you go into this one because it is disturbing, but this book is masterful. I loved it, okay? So once again, I'm just gonna say our main character because I don't remember anybody's names. I don't care what book it is. I don't remember their names. So this book follows the ma two main, two split perspectives, okay? A mother and a daughter. And the daughter, this is a sort of a creepy kid's book, right? The mother, is noticing some very strange behavior by her young daughter. So she decides to take her daughter on this trip to go back to the mother's hometown called Sundial. And she is going to have to make a very difficult decision because, well, you see, you see why and you see what the daughter's doing. But then we have the daughter 
her perspective and she is looking at her mother like my mother is acting very weird right and she's taking me away on this secluded like to, to this secluded place and I'm scared I'm scared of my mother and what she's gonna do to me so it's like who do you trust I love unreliable narrators it is one of my favorite tropes and like styles used to tell a story and it is it is done so successfully in this book like the whole time you don't know like who to trust is the daughter the one that's like acting weird or is it the mother and there's despite also being like split perspective between those two we also have um a split timeline so we follow you know the mother and daughter who go back to sundial and then we follow some past perspective where we see the mother growing up at sundial and her growing up with her twin sister and what their childhood was like right um so this book sundial is primarily a character study and it's an exploration of nature versus nurture which i think is so fascinating the characters in this book are so fascinating i was hooked right from the start there is such such like thick tension throughout i was itching to see where the story would go i was like it's something that i get a lot when i read um lisa jewel's books like this thick tension and dread the entire time where you feel like oh my god so much anxiety the entire time because you just know like oh where like nothing good is gonna happen right this book examines complicated female relationships my favorite thing in fiction you know between sisters mothers and daughters like if, same thing like I was saying with the writing retreat where we have very complicated women who are morally gray um and it's a character study on that and their dynamics and them interacting with each other. Um, as we parse together the events of the past, right, and see the mother growing up at Sundial and at Sundial and see her now interacting with her daughter and figuring out how to handle the, the daughter's strange behavior, um, the reader gets to decide for themselves whether our identity is determined by blood or by the environment that we were nurtured within. So like I said, there is a strong focus on nature versus nurture in this. And I think that those themes are so fascinating the way that Catriona Ward explores them. At times, it was frustrating reading this book because we see characters making terrible decisions that you know aren't gonna lead to anything good. Um, and it's very frustrating to watch them make these decisions. But I will say I love the resolution and the ending, the plot twist, the ending of this book is so satisfying. So if you are getting frustrated by watching characters make decisions that you're like, oh my God, why? Just hang in there, okay? Because the ending, you will be satisfied. I've said the same thing for every Catriona Ward book I've read, but it still stands that her writing and prose outshines many other authors of the genre especially in sundial like she captures the heat and dust of the desert in the emotions of her characters with precision and elegance i tabbed so many quotes in my copy i had to restrain myself because everything i was writing was standing out to me but it was just it was beautiful overall i am like completely enamored with this author and with Sundial primarily, I also love The Last House on Needless Street. I know, like I said, Little Eve did not get like, only got a three star for me. But if you're listening to me rave about Sundial and seeing the emotion that I feel for this book, that is why I'm considering rereading Little Eve because I've loved this book so much. I want, I want more. I need more from her. Um, so I would, like I said, I would go into this book being mindful of the content warnings. But I also think that there's so much value in the writing in such a lush and complex story that basically boils down to choosing your own fate, right? Um, and I will definitely come back to this book for a reread in the future 100% and certainly pick up anything that Catriona Ward comes out with in the future because she is an incredible favorite of all time author in Sundial. You will see this book on my best of 2023 list I can promise you that Whew. I have been filming over an hour at this point I hope I can edit this video down to less than an hour because oh my god that is way too long to be talking about 17 books um but yeah March was a wonderful reading month to have six five stars five four stars like 
I only had one two-star and I didn't have anything less than that. So that was incredible. I had so many amazing books this month. Also Ghost Eaters. Ghost Eaters. I loved that book too. That is another favorite of the year. Um, yeah. So I'm really pleased with how March went. We're in April now. It is April 2nd. I am excited to see what I can read this month. I hope I can read a little bit more this month because March, I was in a reading slump for the beginning of it. Oh, also, everything that I talked about in this video, I do have a reading vlog for. So if any of these books aren't interesting and you want any more thoughts on them or like real-time reaction to these books, check out the reading, reading vlog for these books because, yeah, everything I read, I have another video for. So... Yeah, that is all I have to say. I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to take a breath. I'm going to stop talking. But thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you in my next video.